Oi! If the investor lose confidence in Hong Kong because of this evil bill, then the Hong Kong will economically would also be destroyed. One country, two systems. This was the political and legal framework created to govern Hong Kong when the territory returned to China after 150 years of British rule in 1997. Under this model, Hong Kong was given a special status which allowed the city a degree of autonomy, free speech, and a free flow of information, all of which do not exist on the Chinese mainland. Over the two decades since the sovereign handover, Beijing chipped away at Hong Kong's independence, and each time, Hong Kongers pushed back. The tension hit an apex this summer. It started in March when the Hong Kong government announced a bill that would allow any Hong Kong citizen and foreign individual passing through Hong Kong to be extradited to China. This sparked a series of protests that have drawn upwards of 2 million people into the streets of this global financial center. The protesters have five core demands full withdrawal of the extradition bill, an independent commission to investigate alleged police brutality, retraction of the classification of protesters as rioters, amnesty for arrested protesters, and universal suffrage. Carrie Lam, Hong Kong's chief executive, withdrew the extradition bill in September, but after all the police brutality that occurred, it was, in the words of the protesters, too little, too late. The people of Hong Kong want the remaining four demands met. The question now, how will Beijing and its leader, Xi Jinping, respond? How this scenario would pan out is utterly unclear, and I, I believe that Beijing has actually no interest in repeating uh, Tiananmen uh, situation. However, President Xi has navigated himself into such a deadlock situation that it's, that's quite frankly like, I mean, I've, I don't know how much choice he has. Exactly 30 years ago, Chinese citizens took to Tiananmen Square in Beijing, demanding greater democratic freedoms from the Chinese Communist Party. The result was a lethal crackdown by the Police Liberation Army and the massacre of thousands of peaceful protesters. The leaders of the movement then, as now, were students. One of them was Zhao Feng Shuo. In the aftermath of the massacre, he would be labeled as number five of the 21 most wanted student leaders. I went to Tiananmen Square in the afternoon. Uh, I think I arrived at about uh, 4 p.m. Uh, the moment I, I was there, I can s smile the uh, tear guys. I think this was the uh, first time for me to smile tear guys, and I, I knew this time is different. I realized th this will be a long night, and I, that time I believe that uh, Tiananmen Square it was the center of the moment. It will be the most uh, dangerous place. So that's where I chose to stay. The real shooting actually began at about uh, 9.30 p.m. in the evening of uh, June 3rd. As we were on Tiananmen Square, we heard gunshots uh, coming from all sides of Beijing. And uh, it uh, became really dense at about uh, midnight. It was definitely like a war zone, and we were at the center of the storm. Soldiers were pushing down from the uh, top 
of the monument, of the stairs of the monument, they were pushing down. Uh, so they were pointing guns and using stakes to beat us. Uh, that's how we uh, left Tiananmen Square. I was about uh, the last one to leave on the south side. There was a nurse there. He saw, she saw my name tag with uh, Qinghua. She, she told me, oh, she said, you know, there's a student from Qinghua who died there. And she led me into this uh, uh, bicycle uh, shed. And there was no bicycle there. There were about uh, 40 bodies on the ground, all, uh, many wrapped in uh, white. And um, that's where I saw uh, Zhong Qing, uh, the first one from Qinghua, my school, uh, who I knew well, died there. Uh, uh, that was a moment I would never forget. And that's uh, um, for me as a survivor, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a duty for me to tell the world what I saw. Speaking openly about the Tiananmen Square massacre is not only banned inside mainland China, but many Chinese citizens have never even heard of the incident due to state censorship. In Hong Kong, however, June 4th, 1989 is a date that is commemorated with candlelight vigils across the city. Hong Kong people very much have in their DNA an understanding that Tiananmen was a major event. And so when there have been protests of, of half a million people on the street, a million people on the street, we're often thinking, you know, at what point does China start trying to come into Hong Kong? And this thought occurred again with this recent extradition protest, and it's in fact ongoing right now. There's gonna be some kind of crackdown sooner or later. And the rest of us just wondering, what kind of crackdown is going to it's going to take place? Is it going to be like a Tiananmen style, or is it going to be something slightly different? China has in, in intervened in Hong Kong to such an extent now that it can do what it wants without sending in the army. The way they control Hong Kong now pretty much does the job for them. I think they've almost turned the Hong Kong police into a branch of the mainland police in a way. They they've uh, the police in Hong Kong are acting so out of character. Generally, they've been respected in Hong Kong, and now they're these hardline guys who are using all kinds of abusive tactics. So Beijing's using its hardline approach. One important factor protecting Hong Kong is the city's status as a global financial center, and specifically, China's reliance on Hong Kong to internationalize the Chinese currency, the renminbi, also known as the Yuan. Because Hong Kong is an international financial center, over 75% of uh, uh, yuan, Chinese yuan uh, dominated uh, transactions still are settled in Hong Kong. So if something happened, if the government try to take a uh, chairman style crackdown on Hong Kong Hong Kongers, uh, we can easily see that with international sanction, China going to lose that access to international financial market and settle the yuan, yuan based transaction. And this will not only hurt China economically, but also hurt their ambition because the Chinese government really want to turn Chinese yuan into a US dollar style a reserve, international reserve currencies. I don't think that at this point Beijing would crack down because um, to be honest, the other cities just could not compete with Hong Kong. Because China still relies on Hong Kong, the Chinese Communist Party may take a more measured approach in intervening in the semi-autonomous city. But that doesn't mean Beijing has no options. The Hong Kong government, under the leadership of Carrie Lam, may activate an antiquated ordinance to restore order. If the protest activities continue, then the government may be tempted to introduce the emergency regulations ordinance, which, is, which was an old ordinance established in 1922 in those days. This will give the government uh, very widespread powers uh, to arrest uh, protesters, to deny them habeas corpus, to uh, close down media and so on. 
a big debate has incur occurred because Carrie Lam has kind of hinted that she might use this thing. So instead of sending in, there's two nuclear options is what I'm telling you. One is for Beijing to send in the PLA. The other is for Hong Kong to use the emergency regulations ordinance and, and, and issue these kind of draconian regulations to stop public assemblies and everything. Regardless of how Carrie Lam and her Hong Kong administration moved to contain the unrest, Beijing's propaganda machine is already working overdrive. A couple of things Beijing is doing actually are very similar to what they did back in 1989. One is to change the um, PR, to have a PR war. Uh, when, when we saw Hong Kong, the two million people in Hong Kong peacefully protest back in June, there was no coverage about the peaceful protest in, in China. Basically, the state-controlled media did not report about the peaceful protest at all. But as soon as some of the young protesters uh, vandalized uh, the Hong Kong legislature office, once they have some images about the violence, the Chinese media basically opened the floodgate. They started to broadcast those images everywhere, and they basically labeled those protesters as a as rioters, as a, you know, as violent hooligans. Those are the very similar language the Chinese government used to describe pro-democracy students back in 1989. And they used those language months before they eventually sent the troops for the Tiananmen crackdown. Well, I think in both cases, the demonstrators have sort of had their fill of uh, sort of the party sophistry and prevarication. And uh, in both cases, they, they, they got the ball rolling to the degree where they could do what they wanted to do and force the government in Beijing to listen to them. But of course, while they did that uh, and had a certain justification for doing it, what nobody accounted for was the, the ways in which that sort of wounded the pride and, and deprived the government of a critical uh, face that they depended on to maintain their rule. And that when that happens with a Leninist party, it, it begs an inevitable response. And the response came in 1989. And I think it's inevitable that a similar response, maybe not absolutely like response, but a similar counter response will come from Beijing in regard to, to Hong Kong. Not only is the Chinese Communist Party using propaganda methods they used during Tiananmen to discredit the democracy movement in Hong Kong, they are also exporting current military tactics being used inside the mainland to Hong Kong as well. In one of the protests, uh, protests recently, they used uh, the, the Hong Kong police used the water cannons to shoot the protester back. But the water cannons, the water, they put in blue dye. So because all the, all the protesters were black, right, and a mask, so it's hard to identify. So, what, but when they get hit with blue dye water, it's very easy for them to be identified by the police. And people quickly pointed out in Xinjiang, where right now um, Chinese, um, Chinese authorities basically put over several millions of uh, Uyghurs in, in the intern camps, and those are the same tactics they use to use the dyed water cannon to shoot at the protesters so they can identify who they are. Hong Kong and Beijing are seemingly in a deadlock. So where do we go from here? We've reached a point in Hong Kong where it's very difficult to imagine how it can end with a restoration of the status quo. Xi Jinping and the Beijing government are, are very loath to have to go into Hong Kong, with, particularly with the PLA, maybe the People's Armed Police. But even so, I think they recognize this would be a terrible Rubicon to cross. But something could happen in Hong Kong. Like a bomb could go off, there could be some major violent confrontation. I mean, we're edging ever closer to urban guerrilla warfare. should never, never rule out that if none of this works, a Tiananmen-style crackdown is still 
it's still possible. It's an ideological grip that Xi Jinping wants to hold over Hong Kong, and he also wants to see that wants the world to see that. So you know, talking about what sacrifices is Xi Jinping um, willing to make, I would say you could at least, with some plausibility, think he's actually also willing to pay the ultimate price. However, I feel like the non-military options are not yet fully used up so there could be like you you have control over hong kong's electricity hong kong's water you have it's because it is a part of china even though the the protesters now say it's not i just see like a really really bad uh conclude like result if they bring in the PLA. obviously i don't want that to happen but i can foresee that is one possibility if xi jinping wants to reinforce his power over not just hong kong people but more like the other party that wants to take over his rule. He wants to show them that you can't mess with Hong Kong, this is my land. So it's not as simple as just repressing the Hong Kong people. But the democracy movement in Hong Kong is not solely a Hong Kong issue. How the civil unrest resolves itself has repercussions far beyond the South China Sea. Even the Western democracy, especially the United States, just let Hong Kong fall like this and without no support, it's going to be considered a loss for the liberal order and it's going to be considered a win for the authoritarian, authoritarian model. And we're going to see that it's going to define for decades to come where the rest of the world is going to go. No one can predict how the current democracy movement in Hong Kong will end. But what is certain is that the relationship between Hong Kong and Beijing will continue to evolve. For now, the political and economic destinies of these two very different societies are intertwined. Hong Kong uh, will likely win their uh, freedom uh, through their fighting. It, it will be a long struggle. There's a long way to go. I don't think uh, it could would come tomorrow or in a few months. And uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties, uncertainties, but uh, um, I think uh, Hong Kong uh, will definitely win. Um, the, there is no other choice. What happened in Tiananmen uh, was a clear example. You know, Chinese people love freedom, and they're willing to sacrifice for it. Uh, Thirty years ago. Uh, the Communist Party, you know, against all odds, seems uh, invincible now. But this is a very short time of history. Uh, it's just a blink of time. Uh, I think history is on, on our side. Oh my God! See you later, man! See you later, man!